Hi everyone and welcome to this brand new series of videos we're going to be covering the procedural content generation framework inside of Unreal Engine 5. So I've got Unreal Engine 5.5 loaded up here and what I want to do over the course of this series is show you the basics and also start going to more intermediate and more advanced stuff that you can do with procedural content generation. First of all explaining all the various steps along the way and what it all means so you can better understand it and also better apply it to your own procedural content generation. So we're eventually going to build up to a project and that may come across in its own separate series but here we're going to be covering the very core elements and fundamentals of the procedural content generation. So first of all we're going to start off looking at the data generation that we get from procedural content. So where do we get this data from, how is it generated and what can we do with it. So let's take a look at how this works in the setup for our procedural content generation. Okay, so before you do get started with PCG, you do need to turn on the plugins that enable it. So if you just type in PCG, you'll find you've got the procedural content generation framework. You need this one at least, but you might as well turn them all on. No harm in doing so. And if you want to do biome stuff, we'll, we'll cover that later on. But there's biome stuff too that you can also mess about with as well. And once you've done that, you'll be asked to restart your computer. And once you've done that, uh, you'll be able to find in here the PCG option for your uh, menu here. Now, PCG graphs come like so. Okay, so we can do a little test example. And this is a PCG graph. Now, the fundamental basics of a PCG graph are over here on the left, we've got our, our palette of different nodes that we could use. We've got our graph, obviously, in the middle here. And on the right-hand side, we've got our uh, details. So basically, on what we click on, we see the details of. Now, at the bottom is where you'll see a lot of debug information, but particularly when you start building stuff out more complex, it can be very useful to see what attributes are assigned to each uh, point. But the first thing I want to do is talk about how we generate data points. So when we start with PCG, the first step is generating where you want these data points to generate. And there's different types you can use. And you can combine them all together into a single graph if you like. That's totally up to you. But if you just type in the word data, and if you scroll down, and you'll see it here at the bottom, spatial, we've got get actor data, get uh, dynamic mesh data, landscape data, and so on and so forth. So all these data nodes allow us to grab data from a various thing. So for example, if we're using a spline, it gets us data from that spline. <clears throat> so we're going to start off with a very basic thing we're going to just do a um uh, the spline data and what this will do is we'll grab the spline that is directly linked to our pcg graph now at the moment our pt graph pcg graph does not have any sort of spline on it whatever so where does this spline actually come from so you've got two things you can do the first thing is with these PCG graphs, you can actually just drag them out into your scene and away they go. And once you do that, you can add your components over here in the detail panel and add a spline like so. But what's actually you may find better and a bit more flexible is to create your own actor that you can generate your scene with. So let's say, for example, we're doing a wall and <clears throat> we're going to choose an actor here and we'll do BP wall. And inside our wall here, we're going to add the PCG component and a spline component. So we go PCG, there's our PCG, and we're going to add the spline as well. Now the PCG, what we're going to do is assign our graph to it. So if I go ahead and put in my test example graph here, because it's associated to that spline, it's going to grab that spline. Okay, and we can see that actually happening over here. If I click on my get spline data, the actor filter determines where it's going to get the spline from. So you've got self, which is obviously coming from its own original actor. So if we've done it like the way of what we did with the details panel inside the world, that would work with this in this place here. Uh, parent, so if it's, um, if it's got like a, a parent, uh, class it's going to use uh, all the world actors is if you uh, want to do something all the world things which I would I don't see why you'd ever want to do that but there you go you've got that there 
and you've got a few others such, such as from input as well so you can make it so you input in a spline if you like as well and some of these we'll be covering over the course of these videos so don't worry about them too much but we're gonna leave it as self here and all these data nodes look like this sort of purple pinky color and <clears throat> with this we get the out pin if you expand up your options here, you see a variety of different settings. So the orange pins here are your attribute types, okay? So these are the attributes that you can send into the sketch spline data, and these should basically correlate to what you see in the details panel. So if you want to see um, if it includes all the children, you can add that in here too. Okay, so these are just the parameters that you can set inside of our spline data, or we can just collapse it like that. Now, all of these nodes will have a debug option down the bottom. And these debug options are going to be vital for us testing and figuring out what the hell is actually going on in there. So, at first, it'll be enabled, and we will turn debug on. And with this, you get a point mesh. And the point mesh is the PCG cube is uh, basically what is it going to render as a basically a placeholder stand-in for that spline data. So, with that all done, just like that, if I were to put that into the world like this, you can see that cube is being generated already for our debug. And I can, if I drag out my spline over here, you can see what's going on. Okay, so it's generating these debug meshes at each point of our spline in this case. And if we go into our PC graph, you can see down here um, that we can also change how it scales, we can change what mesh it's using, whatever we want. Another thing we can also do, apart from debugging, is we can also inspect it too. So if I go ahead and inspect it, and if I were to click on the wall, BP wall at the bottom here, click on the PCG, you can see details about every single one of those points that are being generated. So I can see their position in the X and Y and Z, the roll, pitch, your scales, bounds, and so on. Okay, so you can see all these different values coming in from each of those points. Now you can actually add more points to this. We're using more, some more complex things, but we'll cover those in another video. But you can actually add more to those points and so you can get more data from it if you wish. But as you can see, these are pretty good for what you need. Okay. So once we've got the data, we now need to sample the points from that so we can manipulate them or do something with them. So we're going to take out our concrete data pin. And from here, we're going to do sample. And you'll see in here, you've got a variety of things here. We've got a spline sampler. Oh, you've got sample the points, surface sampler, volume sampler. You've got all these various things. We're going to do a spline sampler, obviously, because we're using a spline. And the difference that a spline sampler does is we can divide how we many points we want to put along the spline. Now, as you saw originally, the debug showed the points generating uh, on the debug per point of the spline. But we can actually change that. So that's what the spline sampler does. So over here on the right, you'll see dimension on the spline, mode, you've got subdivision, distance, or number of samples. So I'm going to leave that subdivision first of all. So subdivision per segment, we've got one. And if I hit save and let's go debug this one, Instead, we'll turn that debug off there. And over here, you're going to see weird things happening. Okay, and that's because the sample data that's coming from each one of these is also transforming, uh, getting the transforms of each point as well. And when we place these points out, they're actually stretching out. Okay, so it's getting the scale of them. If you don't want it to show like that, which obviously looks a bit weird. I don't like this myself. You can actually change that on the debug settings. And that's what that scale method means. So here's the extent. So the extent of that section, that subdivision, we don't want that. We want to take absolute. And hit save. And now we get points generating, as you would expect, one per uh, section. Okay. So subdivisions, we're subdividing it by one and adding one point into it. And if I change subdivisions per segment to two, you're going to get two subdivisions per segment of the spline. Okay. So one thing about PCG graphs is they come in two forms. We've got bounded or unbounded. So bounded means they're going to stay within the volumes uh, that they're generated in. So this would be more obvious with the PCG dragged in. You can see we've got a volume around it. 
that means it will only generate inside that volume if it's bound. If you make it unbound, it means it can go anywhere you like. So you've got that option over on the sampler as well. Um, if I go to that, we've got unbounded. So you can turn it off and on as you so wish. Um, also got various options such as what kind of attributes you want to get from it um, and various other things like seeds and things like that. But the attributes are pretty useful because let's say you want to change something based upon the distance that it has between other points. You can do that with compute distance. Okay. And you'll add an extra attribute to it. So if I go compute distance here and if I inspect this one over here now, now we're going to see here we've got all the various points appearing in our details at the bottom here. But if I go across, you'll see distance is now appearing. And we now got a distance of zero for the first point, which makes sense. It's the first point. Next one's 241, then 482, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you've got a really easy way to add more details to your attribute points if you need them. So now we've got this out point here this is point data so when you see dark blue it's point data we're going to take this and we're going to spawn static meshes first of all i will come back to spline meshes in a second uh static mesh spawner and over here on the right hand side i can choose what mesh we're going to have so mesh entries we can add a mesh to this and we go to the descriptor and we'll describe it as having um i don't know bents now we'll do fence posts. Okay. So what we get now are our fence posts being generated along it. The debug is still going to show, but let's we can turn it off now. We've got the static mesh in there, so let's turn off our debug. Shortcut, by the way, for that is D. And for inspection is A. So if we want to turn it off and on, you can do. But that's now going to spawn static meshes at those various sampled points. Okay. And we can sample it down to the ground like that. I'm hitting end, by the way. If you didn't realize that was a, a shortcut you could do, you can just do end like that. But here we go. We've got our fence post being projected down onto the ground based upon our wall here. So it makes it really quick and easy if you want to generate more fence posts around now at the moment the issue we have is they're being created by subdivisions by section so if the subdivisions aren't equal in their spacing you get kind of bunched up looking things so if i push this all the way up here for example you get sort of bunched up look and it looks really weird so what will actually be better off is using a distance based one so if we go ahead back to our ptg go to a spline sampler and change the mode from subdivision down to distance and we've now got a distance increment of 100. So what it's going to do now is rather than put in one every subdivision, it's now going to do it every 100. So now we shouldn't get any sort of weird spacing issues as it should be evenly spaced by 100 units. Okay. Important to note as well with splines, if you didn't realize a little thing about them, if you want to make it a sharp corner, just right click on that point and you'll see spline point type, change that to linear. And then do the same for the other one. Linear. You get sharp corners instead. Yeah. So there is our spline sampler. Okay, we're putting down these various fence posts. But let's go ahead one step further and actually generate the mesh in between those fence posts. So for that, I need the mesh. So let's go ahead and take a look at what meshes we've got. I'm going to search for a fence. And I quite like this one. Yeah, there's a fence. We'll take that. Okay. And what I want to do with this fence is I want it to... I'll, I'll allow it to go curvy. It will look weird, curvy, but whatever, we'll do curvy. Uh, just to show you something else you can do. So there's also a spline mesh spawner. Spline mesh spawner. 
But notice how it needs concrete data rather than the point data. So I can plug it in directly into the spline data here if I wanted to. And I can then go to the spline mesh uh, descriptor, put in our fence panel. And you can see that it's posting this fence panel all over the place. Now it's going to look a bit weird because obviously our scaling is a bit weird. So let's go check out what scale this actually is. So this is 250. Okay. So back to my PCG on the spline sampler, we're going to do distance increment of 250. First of all, and the spline mesh parameters here, uh, we'll leave this here. So by the way, if you wanted to change things like um, which direction the spline mesh should be going in, you can change the forward axis if you want over here too, plus various other things that you can normally associate with splines if you've used them before. Okay, so we are getting some weird behaviors. Okay, if I move them around, we continue to get weird behaviors. Now, the weird behavior that we're seeing is no doubt got something to do with A, the mesh itself, because spline meshes work best when they've got lots of subdivisions. But more importantly, notice how it's now trying to stretch it from this point over to this point. That's not correct. Yeah, we want it to go in between the fence posts. So the way we do that is with a spline sampler, we are basically rebuilding a new spline. So we're going to take these points out here and create a new spline, create spline, and then use that as my as my spline mesh. Now notice how it's going to generate the fence panels around in between each of those fence posts. So what we're doing there is we're taking this spline sampler, the points that are coming from it, and saying, hey, each of these points, I want you to create a new spline based upon these points. And then I'm using that to generate our spline mesh here. On the create spline, you can do things like create closed loops. But one thing that's really useful is you can make it all linear. So rather than going over and clicking each point and making them linear, you just tick this button. And it makes the whole thing linear. See how it generates them? We now got straight edges for our thing. Even though the spline itself is curved, the position and placement of our fences are no longer going to be curved. They're going to be appropriate to what they actually should be. There you go. So there you go, there we have the sort of intro to PCG and talking about how we get data from an asset and feed it into our PCG graph. And hopefully this made it a bit more easy to understand what the hell it is you're looking at when you look at a PCG graph. Now this is just the start, we're going to look at various different other types of data samples in the next few videos and look at all the different options and ways you could use PCG to speed up your workflow. After all, that is what it's meant for, is to help that speeding up workflow process. So if you want to see more videos like this and want to support the channel, head over to patreon.com forward slash Ryan Laley. We can find all my videos early before everyone else from just $1 a month. Uh, that kind of support is amazing. So thank you so much, everyone over there already who is supporting the channel. Otherwise, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and make sure you tune in for the next part coming soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.